Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to today's last talk. Um, our speaker uh, is um, Professor Nathan Fluger from Arms Co Ames College um, in Massachusetts. So he's it's early morning for him, and he's kindly uh, uh, he has kindly agreed to uh, start, give this uh, relatively early morning talk. And uh, we are very happy to to uh, have him here and looking forward to his talk. So the topic is vertex gluings and demaser products, as you can see. So over to you, uh, Nathan, looking forward to the talk. <laughs> forward to your talk. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here virtually. Uh, I wish I could have been here in person. Um, but uh, I, uh, fortunately, uh, my, my family had a, had a new baby join the family in May. And so I'm not, not traveling much, but I'm, I'm glad to be able to join at least for, for this talk. So what I want to talk about today is a, uh, a preprint that I put on the archive back in January. You can see the title of it here. It's called a Hurwitz Pearl Norther General Graphs uh, and the Demaser Product. Um, and also touch a little bit on a preprint that's actually going to appear later today on the archive, also to do with Demaser Products. So my goal in this, this talk is to try to convince you that this, this operation, this Demaser Product of integer permutations is an interesting operation that has something to, to say about uh, tropical geometry and, and algebraic geometry. So uh, my goal in this talk is not to be totally um, comprehensive. I want to really just focus on kind of a simplified version of some of the problems I'm interested in so that I can show the techniques. And hopefully that'll convince you to, to learn a little bit more uh, about it. So with that in mind, I wanna tell you some two simplified versions of uh, some theorems that I really like. One is a pretty classical theorem, and one is a much more recent theorem. And the classical one, this is called the uh, brill norther theorem. This is a, a theorem that was stated, at least, in the late 19th century by, by Brill and Noether, uh, but not proved until 1980 by Griffiths and Harris. And there's a couple of different ways to prove this theorem, but just to state this theorem, what this theorem is about is it tells you if you have a line bundle on a general algebraic curve of genus G, it tells you how special that line bundle could possibly be. Uh, so the simplest way in my mind to state this bound is the following. We imagine that we have a general curve of genus G. Uh, so this means that I'm, uh, if you like, choosing a random curve from the moduli space, and I'll tell you something that is true with probability one. If you take any line bundle on that curve, so any line bundle L, it's gonna satisfy this inequality that the space of, the dimension of the space of global sections, that line bundle multiplied by H1 of that line bundle is less than or equal to the genus G. So the way that you should think about this is that this is a bound on how special uh, a line bundle can be on a genus G curve. And the reason that this word general is important here is that some curves are more special than others and more special curves can have more special line bundles. But the goal of the brill the theorem is to tell you the, the ground state, the, the least special uh, situation. And it's given by this, by this kind of nice inequality that H naught and H1 uh, can't multiply to any more than G. There's a couple of different ways to say this theorem. So let me just quickly mention a uh, uh, different notation that maybe is a little bit more familiar. Uh, and it says the following. Uh, if R is equal to H naught of L minus one, um, so this is the projective dimension of the linear series, complete linear series of this line bundle. And if D is the degree of the line bundle, uh, this says the following inequality. It says that G minus R plus one times G minus D plus R is greater than or equal to zero. So that R plus one is the H naught term the G minus D plus R is the H1 term. And that's just Riemann rock, the uh, computation of one, one from the other. Okay, so, so this formula here, this is the so-called brill Northern number. And this is a form that may be more familiar if you've, if you've studied uh, some, uh, say, Harris Morrison's book on moduli of curves or something like that. So this is the classical brill Northern theorem. But, and for today, I want to think about it in terms of this, this inequality here. Okay, so this is a this is a famous theorem. It's been around for forty years now, so certainly uh, much longer than I've been alive. But very recently, there is a a new version of it, a reframing of it that I like quite a bit. Uh, partly because uh, I uh, work, worked on this a little bit back about uh, six years or so ago, in some of the early stages. And this, I'm going to refer to this as the Hurwitz-Brill-Norther theorem. 
So this name is not totally standard yet, but it's becoming more and more standard as more people work on this problem. And the situation in the hurwitz brillner other theorem is that rather than looking in the moduli space of curves, we're looking at what's called the Hurwitz space of covers. So what we have here is not an algebraic curve, but rather a cover. So an algebraic curve together with a rational function, a map to P1. And we choose its degree, degree K, and we choose the genus of the curve, genus G. And we try to answer the same question. If you choose a general point, a general cover of a given degree and a given genus, now how special can a line bundle be? So uh, this uh, problem went through a couple kind of metamorphoses before we worked out what the right way to, to formulate this theorem was. Uh, and here's one way to say it. This is going to be kind of a more opaque version, but I'm just going to write this down. Um, one way to say it is that the dimension of x1 of the push forward of this line bundle down to p1 must be less than or equal to g. So this looks like a little bit of an abstract expression. If you're like me, uh, whenever you see uh, things like x or, or these kind of cohomological constructions, you get a little bit nervous because it's hard to see where the intuition comes from. But this is something that you can, that is very computable. You can make this very concrete. I just wanted to phrase it this way because it shows the, the comparison very clearly between the classical Brillner theorem and the Hurwitz Brillner theorem. They're both saying if you have a line bundle and you push it down either to spec of the field or to P1, uh, and then take some sort of cohomology, you get a bound uh, in terms of the genus on, on just how special that, that push forward can be. So this is the hervis brown other theorem, and it's answering the same question. It's telling you how special a line bundle can be on a general cover. Uh, and this was proved uh, by uh, uh, jointly, um, well, parts of this were proved jointly by Cook, Paula Jensen, and Hannah Larson. Uh, and the strongest theorems were proved by Hannah Larson. Um, and you'll can find this in uh, uh, in an uh, archive, something that was put on the archive in 2019 and, and appeared relatively recently. I, I should also mention that this theorem, uh, there's a vast strengthening of this that appeared uh, a little bit more recently in a paper of uh, Hannah Larson, Eric Larson, and Isabel Vogt. Uh, that's a really, uh, really awesome paper. So I like this theorem a lot. And uh, if you just blur your vision for a little bit and just think about the big picture. What this is saying is it answers the question, how special can a line bundle be on a, on a general cover? It finds a way to quantify that. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the st uh, starting point, these two big theorems in, in algebraic geometry. And maybe I'll just make a quick comment without spending too much time on this, that I called these the weaker, weak forms of these theorems, simplified forms. Um, I just made a quick note here about what the stronger form of both these theorems are, if you know what, want to know what these, these look like. So I'm formulating these as an inequality, but you can also make an existence statement, which says that you can now look at the locus of algebraic curves that are special to a given extent. So if you look at all the line bundles with a given value of H1 and a given value of H0, that has a parameter space and you can actually write down its dimension. It's given by the genus minus the product of those two. Or in the Hurwitz situation, you look at all the possible line bundles that have a given push forward. So this is a vector bundle on P1. It splits as a direct sum of line bundles. And you can write down this expression here in terms of that splitting into line bundles that tells you exactly the dimension of the space of line bundles with a particular uh, push forward. OK, so I don't want to say too much more about these stronger forms just to stay focused on, on the version that I want to talk about today, but I just at least wanted to put those on the screen so you can see that, um, see something about what these stronger forms look like. And there's theorems about smoothness and irreducibility and, and that kind of thing as well, if you, if you dig into the literature on this. So uh, my goal today uh, is relatively modest. I'm not going to think about these, these parameter spaces really at all. I just want to talk about this simplified version where I think about this, in e this inequality, the product of H0 and H1. And I want to look at a tropical version of this uh, that, I, that I like quite a bit. Uh, that's a useful tool for, for studying the, the situation in algebraic geometry as well. So that's, of course, why, uh, why the stock is fitting into this particular uh, conference on, on combinatorial methods in, uh, in algebraic geometry. Uh, and maybe I'll pause here before I go on just to ask if there are any questions about this, this basic setup. If there's anything that I should define or clarify. Any questions, comments? Yes, a quick question. Uh, 
Uh, can we just uh, just a basic question? So, what is that? Uh, what is the meaning of ext one? Ah, um, so this is the uh, uh, so it's the ext of two different uh, line bundles. Um, you can actually formulate this in a slightly more concrete way. So, so it's I mean the one thing I can say is it's, the, it's a derived functor for the Hom functor, which is not super concrete, but a slightly more concrete way to say this is that this is the same thing as um, H1 of uh, this vector bundle dual tensor product with the, with the vector bundle. Or in other words, the H1 of the endomorphism. Let me actually, that's a more clear way to say it. H1 of the endomorphisms of, of this vector bundle. So that's maybe a slightly more concrete way to say it. Um, but you can, because we're working on P1, you can make it pretty concrete. And so actually this expression down here kind of shows you most of what you need to know about this X1, that it's, it's measure, it, I, I think the, the, maybe the best way to think about this is it measures how well this vector bundle is balanced. So if you look at this expression here, the, the differences of these degrees minus one, um, if, as long as all these degrees are within one of each other, this number is zero. And then the, the less balanced the vector bundle gets, the larger this number gets. So maybe that's what I'll say about the, the X one for now. So, and uh, so, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So OEI is the ith uh, line bundle of uh, the projective space. Correct. Yes. So, so the uh, what I'm omitting from the notation here is um, this is O P one of um, yeah th yeah these are line bundles on the projective line. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Great. Um, so, so I'll go on, and I, I should say by the way, I do feel free to ask questions at any point during the talk today. I don't have to. Um, uh, I'm happy to, to move back and forth between making it more interactive. Okay, so what I want to uh, tell you about now is a tropical analog of this whole uh, setup. And the idea is in, in tropical, uh, tropical geometry, we have an analog of algebraic curves, which are, uh, in, the, in the simplest case, these are graphs or metric graphs. And I've written metric in parentheses because I can actually be talking about a finite graph or a metric graph, and it doesn't make a difference for any of the theorems that I'll state. Uh, so if a metric graph, it has genus G, which just means that its, uh, it's uh, fundamental group has rank G, if you like, uh, and it has canonical divisor K. Um, and I'm going to be considering uh, divisors on this graph uh, in terms of something called their baker norian rank. So there's a number of definitions here that uh, I'm not going to go into in full detail in this talk, um, uh, but um, the uh, divisors on a metric graph you can think of as chip configurations, and the rank gives it gives a measure on how flexible a chip configuration is. So if you've studied uh, chip firing on, on metric graphs, uh, these these notions um, uh, are used quite often. Um, and maybe actually this is a good point to, to ask. Uh, if if I should go into more detail about the Baker Noreen rank, or if this is something that um, that is familiar to, to folks in the audience. Yeah, we just discussed this yesterday. So oh, great. most audience are familiar with it. So yeah, you need not spend so much time on that meeting. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So this is the, the notion I'm uh, considering. And the key definition here is that I want to say what it means to be a brill noether general graph. So remember the brill noether theorem was about a general curve of genus G and some curves are more special than others. Likewise, some metric graphs are more special than others. And for purposes of this story, the general uh, situation is the situation where I have this same inequality as in the algebraic curves case. So I want to say that for every divisor D on the metric graph, I have an inequality and you should, this inequality is the analog of saying that H naught times H one is less than or equal to G, but I'm formulating this in, in terms of the Baker Norian rank. So instead of H uh, naught, I say rank plus one. Instead of H one, I say rank of, uh, of the dual uh, my, uh, plus one. So a graph is called Brillner other general if uh, for every divisor, the product of these two numbers is less than or equal to G. And maybe I should, I should remark that the reason people cared about this originally 
is that this implies that any curve specializing to this graph, specializing in the sense of, uh, for example, uh, Matt Baker's paper, or in terms of non-Archimedean analytification, uh, so any graph specialized, any curve specializing to to gamma is also Brillouin other general in the in the case in the sense that algebraic curves can be Brillouin other general. Okay, so that's the reason people cared about it originally. Uh, in my opinion, the this problem is interesting in its own right. I think there's a lot of really interesting combinatorics. So um, I tend to just think Brillouin other general graphs are interesting for their own sake at this point. But of, but originally the reason anyone started caring about these was this this link to to algebraic curves. So there's a, a, a really nice theorem from 2012 uh, by Cool, Strasma, Payne, and Rabeva that gave the first example of a Brillouin other general graph, or really I should say a family of Brillouin other general graphs in every genus. And this family is now a, a pretty famous graph among the, uh, the chip firing commu community. Uh, it's called the chain of loops, and it looks like this, it looks like a, a chain of loops. And you need to specify some data on these on this chain. So I should specify, for example, you know, the lengths of uh, the upper and the lower paths in each of these uh, uh, loops. Um, but as long as you make this choice generic enough, uh, where generic can, for example, mean that the upper length is one and the lower length is sufficiently large, but it's in general it's a, it's a certain uh, arithmetic condition. Uh, as long as it's sufficiently generic, this is a Brillouin other general graph. So it doesn't have divisors that are more special than you would expect on a general genus G curve. Okay. Um, so this was proved in 2012, and this, this example of the chain of loops has turned out to be a really useful uh, family of graphs ever since then. Uh, it seems, for reasons that are still a little bit unclear to me, it seems to behave a lot like a general curve of genus G. So you can use it to study a number of problems in Brill and other theorem, in Brill and other theory. It's been used to think about the maxwell rank conjecture. It's been used to think about uh, the Brill and other theorem itself, uh, the giesecker petri theorem, and a number of, other, uh, number of other things. So it seems to be a pretty versatile graph. And part of the impetus for this project that I'm telling you about today is I was trying to find a way to articulate why this is such a useful graph for these sorts of problems. So what exactly is it about the structure of this graph that has made us so amenable to studying Brill and other theory? So that's part of what I want to try to explain. Uh, so this was the first example. This was a nice uh, tropical curve with this uh, Brill and other generality condition. And the first step that I, that I want to, to make um, to modify this story is to change the point of view a little bit and think not about graphs per se, but actually about graphs with two marked points. So uh, the so in this slide, uh, the switch that I'm making is now I'm considering not just, an, not just a single graph, but this triple here. So this is a metric graph together with two vertices, V and W. Uh, and that's what I mean by a twice marked graph. So a graph with two marked points. Now, the reason it's useful to think about twice marked graphs is, if you want to think about the chain of loops, for example, is that you can think about the chain of loops as the result of, of splitting twice marked graphs into pieces over and over again. Uh, and it's important to keep track of what these marked points are. It's important to keep track of the attachment points. So the overall philosophy here is I want to kind of reinterpret the chain of loops story uh, inductively by studying the loops individually together with their, their marked points where, where they're being attached to each other. So uh, to do this, what we can do is basically modify the condition of being Brillouin other general to be a condition on twice marked graphs, not on, uh, not on graphs themselves. Uh, and here's the way that I want to do this. Uh, the basic idea is that I want to measure specialness uh, of a divisor not just by the rank of the divisor, but with a whole grid of ranks. So I want to measure all of the ranks, rank of divisor plus a multiple, uh, a linear combination of the marked points. So all the ranks of uh, divisor plus AV minus BW. The reason I have plus AV minus BW uh, is a matter of convenience. Um, it's just going to make a lot of the later definitions a little bit easier. It makes the inductive machinery a little a little simpler. 
I just as well could have written plus AV plus BW, but um, this convention just makes things come out a little bit neater. Okay, so this is the first observation is that if I want to do this whole story inductively and think about graphs with two marked points, uh, when I'm studying a divisor, I really don't just want the divisor, I want all of these uh, all of these twists of the divisor, as I, as I usually call them. So divisor plus a combination of the marked points. And uh, so this is a whole uh, grid of numbers. There is for every choice of integers A and B, you get a, get a rank. And so we need a way to encode this in some sort of combinatorial object. And the uh, uh, next observation is an idea that comes from the theory of degeneracy loci. Uh, which is that you can actually use a permutation. So a permutation of the integers to encode all these ranks at once. Uh, so I'm gonna first say a little technical condition here, which is that if D is submodular, uh, and this is a term I introduced. So if it's not familiar, there's you know, no reason for it to be familiar, uh, but uh, I want to just leave this as a black box for a second and I'll make that definition uh, later. Um, if D is submodular, sub it turns out that there exists a permutation that I'll call tau d. And this is a permutation of the full set of integers uh, that encode, encodes all these ranks. Uh, and here's how it encodes them. Uh, before I write a formula, I'm gonna gesture at this picture here on the right uh, of the screen. So this picture is, is going to be showing uh, exactly what I'm going to write down in the formula. The idea is that if I have a permutation of the integers, I can graph it. So on the x-axis I have n, and on the y-axis I have tau of n, and this sequence of purple dots it tells, shows you the graph of a permutation. And what I want to do is I want to choose this permutation in such a way that if I draw this little, uh, this little diagram here of a lower right quadrant and an upper left quadrant, I want the lower right quadrant, if I count the number of dots in it, I want that to count the rank of the divisor, uh, plus one. And if I count the dots in the upper left quadrant, I want that to count the rank of the dual. So rank of K minus D plus one. So in this picture, as you slide this frame around, so as you, uh, as you move these uh, orange quadrant and, and green quadrant to the left or, and uh, to left and right or up and down, that's gonna correspond to adding multiples of the marked point of one more marked point or adding multiples of the other. And we're gonna arrange these dots in such a way that they exactly track how those ranks change as you make those, uh, as you make those revisions to the divisor. So this is the idea. I want this, uh, I want this permutation to encode this thing. And if I encode this in a formula, here's what it looks like. It says for all integers m and n, if I want the rank of this twisted version of the divisor, what I should do is, is make the following enumeration, count all the integers greater than or equal to n, such that tau of l is less than or equal to m. And then likewise for the dual situation, I want kind of the opposite quadrant. And here I'm counting the number of integers L less than N such that the tau of L is greater than M. So those are, uh, this, this is the way you can turn this into a formula. And there are some details in this formula that I don't want to dwell on because they're there for technical reasons. So like, why did I write N here and M here? And why did I write my inequalities this, uh, this particular way? Um, and I don't really want to get into those because they're just there for technical reasons. I, I, most of what you want to, what, most of what I want you to know for the talk right now is this picture. Uh, you graph the permutation and then you consider this little moving frame of quadrants and that's counting rank of the divisor and rank of the dual. Okay, so this is the idea. Uh, and then I, maybe I'll say one word about this, this bit of jargon I introduced here, this word submodular. Uh, I'll just say that this is a convexity condition. Uh, and I don't fully understand this condition yet. There's a, I have a student actually who's studying basically how prevalent submodular divisors are on metric graphs, if we expect them to be the norm or the exception. Uh, but I will say at least that 
the analogous condition always holds on algebraic curves. So in that sense, it's a reasonable uh, condition to impose on graphs that resemble algebraic curves. Uh, okay, so that's all I say about some modularity for now, but I can I can tell you more about it uh, in the questions at the end of the talk if you want to know know more details. Okay, so uh, to recap what I've shown you on this slide so far, uh, I have a I have a graph with two specific marked points. I want a way to measure how special a divisor is, and the way that I do that is that I draw this this array of dots that encodes all at once all of the ranks of all twists of the divisor. And by a twist, I mean divisor plus a linear combination of the marked points. Uh, okay, and the uh, key observation the, that shows you that this permutation is encoding something relating to brill theory, as theory, as I've set it up before, is uh, a little inequality, which is that if you count the number of inversions of this permutation, and by inversions, I mean just a pair of integers, u and v, such that u is less than v, but tau of u is greater than tau of v. So it's just a pair of integers whose relative ordering is reversed by the permutation. If you count the number of inversions, uh, it's definitely at least the, the product of the rank of the divisor plus one, times the rank of k minus the divisor plus one. And the reason is shown in this picture, which is that if I count the rank plus one by the lower right quadrant and the rank of the dual plus one by the upper left quadrant, every pair of a dot in the upper left and a dot in the upper right gives you an inversion. So I'm drawing these orange lines here in the picture to show you that you have two chips in the lower right, two chips in the upper left. So you have at least two times two inversions here. So uh, the number of inversions of this permutation is getting you this, uh, this quantity that showed up in the Brillner the theorem for, special, for measuring how special a line bundle is. And that tells you that this number of inversions uh, is now going to be our new measure Uh, of how special a divisor is on a twice marked graph. Okay, so this is the so this is the setup. Uh, I should now be uh, make the transition if I'm thinking about uh, marked points to thinking about number of inversions rather than thinking about uh, the product of these two ranks. Uh, and maybe this is a good point to pause and ask if there are uh, questions or anything I should uh, clarify before going on. Okay. Yes, it looks like we are good. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, say it again. Yeah, so I mean, people would like to know the definition of uh, submodularity, but that that you can we can do it at the end of the talk. The questions. Okay. Um, well, maybe actually, since there was an interest in it, maybe I will just quickly. Uh, I'll just show you the def just the definition, uh, with, and then um, maybe we can uh, elaborate on it a little bit more later. Uh, so here's the condition: uh, divisor is submodular on a twice marked graph if it has the following property. Uh, for every one of these twists, so divisor plus a multiple of the marked points, it satisfies this condition here, that if the rank is unchanged when you subtract W, then if you subtract V from the divisor, the rank is still unchanged if you subtract W again. So the way that uh, you can think of this if, you, uh, if you're thinking in terms of algebraic curves is if W is a base point, of the complete linear series of the divisor, um, then it's still a base point after you subtract V. So this is certainly true on algebraic curves because um, uh, 
So having a base point simply means that you have this complete linear series, the set, set of divisors, and the rank being the same after respect V just means that every single one of those divisors contains the vertex V. That's still true if you consider any subseries. So this is always true on algebraic curves, but it's a little bit more subtle on metric graphs. So this is, the, this is what I mean by submodular. And uh, maybe I'll also just write a, a quick inequality here. The reason I call this submodular is it corresponds to the following inequality. If, if you think about the rank of the divisor minus the rank of V minus W and the rank of V minus V and add to it the rank of divisor minus both V and W, uh, this should be less than or equal to zero. Oh, I'm sorry, greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Uh, the reason I call it submodular instead of supermodular has to do with uh, a technicality of how some of the definitions are set up. But this inequality is another way to think about this. Uh, and this has a concrete interpretation and in, in, as a dimension of a vector space if you're working on with algebraic curves. Okay, so maybe that's all I'll say about the definition of submodular for now, uh, but I'm happy to return to it um, uh, later in the talk to say a little bit more about it. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, and maybe actually, uh, I'll just say a little bit, uh, I will say now that I've told you the definition of submodular, um, I'll, like I said, there's a lot that's unknown about this that I think would be interesting to study. Uh, what I do know so far is that on chains of loops, if you mark the opposite ends of the chain, all divisors are submodular. Uh, there's also some closure properties. If you take two twice marked graphs, all of whose divisors are submodular and you glue them together, you still have the property that all divisors are submodular. So there's so this, this, this uh, submodularity property is kind of preserved by gluing in a certain sense. Um, and I have a student who is an uh, undergraduate student who wrote a senior thesis recently where he worked out uh, in the genus two case, uh, which genus two graphs have submodular divisors and which don't. Um, but in genus three and above, I think the situation is still, still pretty mysterious. But I think it's a natural condition, um, again, because of where it occurs in algebraic curves. Okay. Uh, so with that said, let me state uh, one of the theorems that's in this uh, preprint uh, that I'm talking about. And this, uh, if you think about the number of inversions of this permutation as being an analog of this measure of specialness, this H0 times H1, then I hope this theorem looks relatively plausible. And it says that the chain of loops is Brill and other general in a twice marked sense. Uh, and, the twice, and the sense is the following. If you have a generic chain of loops, and again, generic is a certain condition that I won't spell out here just for time, but I can, I can certainly tell you concretely. And you mark the two points at the opposite end of the chain, then every divisor is submodular. Uh, so that's what I mentioned out loud just, uh, just now. And it satisfies this inequality that if you look at the permutations associated to these divisors, they always have at most G inversions. Okay. Um, so in particular, this implies this implies that this uh, graph is Brillner other general in the in the previous sense uh, because this uh, number of inversions is greater than or equal to this uh, product of two ranks. So this is sort of a twice marked version of this, uh, of this uh, generality. And uh, maybe I'll just make a quick comment about the way that this is proved uh, and, you'll, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the methods in a, in a second. Uh, but the idea is that this is a proof by in, uh, proved by induction. Uh, so the base case is just a single cycle. Uh, and for the inductive step, Uh, I'll just say that the inequality is preserved by gluing. And I'll make that a little bit more precise a little bit later in the talk. But uh, the reason that I mentioned that is because this, this theorem is about chains of loops, but the methods that I'm talking about will work more generally. 
to tell you things like if you ever find me a theta graph or any graph actually with this uh, that satisfies this inequality, you can then put it into change of their graphs to make uh, Brill and other graphs of any genus. So you could say take a, a theta graph with this generality property and glue a chain of cycles onto it and get, get more Brill and other general graphs that way. So, uh, so I, I claimed that part of the impetus for this project was to understand what's so special about the chain of loops. And so here I can tell you what's so special about the chain of loops. It's not that this chain of loops is special, it's that graphs that can be broken down by vertex gluing are special. And it's just that the chain of loops has been broken down as much as possible by vertex gluing. So you break it down to the simplest non-trivial graphs, the simplest graphs that are not trees, which are cycles, and then you just study those cycles individually. Um, so that's what's going on in this theorem. And I, and I like to think of it as sort of an explanation for why we've been seeing this graph so much that really we've been thinking about twice marked graphs all along. We're just in kind of hiding that in the combinatorics. Okay. Um, so uh, the chain of, uh, chain of loops is, has this nice property that um, transmission these transmission permutations are always there and they have at most G inversions. Uh, and I just wanna mention briefly uh, I think I won't spend too much time on this slide, uh, just so I can keep moving along. Uh, but I do want to say that this theorem, you can also make very precise, so you can really do computations with it. So uh, not only does every divisor satisfy the inequality that, it, that the number of inversions of the permutation is at most g, but there's also a converse statement. If you choose a permutation with at most g inversions, you can quite explicitly construct a divisor with that permutation. And so uh, here's, uh, here's an example. If this is the permutation I'm interested in, uh, this, uh, uh, this permutation tau, whose graph is shown on the, on the left-hand side, you can construct a divisor by first factoring it into adjacent transpositions. Adjacent transpositions uh, together with a shift um, so the shift is um, just mapping n to n plus one. Once you have this factorization, this actually tells you exactly how to write down a divisor with this permutation. So for example, the fact that I shifted by one is going to tell me to put negative one chips on the far left of the chain. And then the way that I construct the rest of the divisor follows a nice little recipe. Um, I label the positions on each one of these loops in the following way. I call the right marked point position zero, the left marked point position negative one, and then equally space out position one, two, three, et cetera, in one direction, and positions negative one, negative, uh, negative two, negative three in the opposite direction. And then what I want to look at are these numbers in the adjacent transpositions. So negative one, zero, negative two, and negative one. And that's just going to tell me exactly where to put the chips. So the on cycle one, I put a chip at position negative one. On cycle two, I put a chip at position zero. On cycle three, I put a chip at position negative two. On cycle four, I put a chip at position negative one. Okay. okay, so I know I was very fast about that construction and uh, I think just for time reasons, I don't wanna to spend too much longer on this slide, uh, but the main, point I want to make here is that this is a very concrete procedure. So if you write down any permutation with the most G inversions, all you have to do is factor it into a shift permutation and then a bunch of adjacent transpositions and the which adjacent transpositions you've written down can tell you a recipe for exactly where to put the chips on this chain, uh, on this chain of loops. Um, this, by the way, is, is sort of a new version of uh, the original construction that Pools, Drazman, Payne, and Rebeva gave. Uh, in that construction, you write down, instead of factoring a permutation into adjacent transpositions, you write down a standard Young tableau on a, on a rectangular uh, 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 partition. And where you put the numbers in that tableau tell you where to put the chips. And there's a dictionary between these two things. This is a generalization of, of that construction. Okay. So uh, this is part of what's so nice about the chain of loops is that you can really parameterize things explicitly on it. Okay, so uh, just to quickly recap again, chain of loops has this property that every divisor is associated to a permutation. That permutation has at most G inversions. And conversely, every permutation with at most G inversions corresponds to at least one divisor on the graph. 
uh, by, uh, by this explicit parameterization. Okay. So in the remaining uh, uh, couple, uh, 20 or so minutes of the talk, I wanna say more about the method of proof here. So what's the basic tool uh, that I'm using to prove this theorem? Uh, that I'm and that I'm hoping to use to, to prove some more theorems in the in the future, uh, and the key tool is this operation uh, is this interesting operation on permutations that's called the de Maizer product. Uh, and so the de Maizer product, of course, I mentioned in the in the title of the talk as well. So the de Maizer product is a certain associative operation on permutations uh, that originally was discovered by by de Maizer in the context of some. Uh, some problems in uh, with about Schubert varieties, namely about resolving singularities of, of Schubert varieties. And it's a it's an associative product um, that has this this interesting greedy characterization. So this is sometimes called a greedy product. And here's the way in which it's a greedy product is if you have any permutation alpha in this metric group, so permutation of n letters. And then I take a simple reflection, right? By a simple reflection, I mean uh, the transposition of two adjacent uh, integers. Uh, the de Maizer product of alpha and the simple reflection is either a times alpha or, sorry, either alpha times sigma or alpha. So you either multiply by the simple transposition or you don't. And the way that you decide is you check whether it would add more inversions to the permutation or not. So when you multiply by a, by a simple transposition, you either add one inversion or you remove one inversion, depending on uh, whether alpha of n and alpha of n plus one are, depending on the relative order of alpha n and alpha n plus one. And in the de Maizer product, you choose whichever one makes the number of inversions as large as possible. So this is a nice characterization, again, on the symmetric group for the, for the de Maizer products. And uh, this is a nice description. You can do lots of computations with it. Uh, in my mind, the main defect of this definition is that, to me at least, it's not at all obvious that this is a well-defined operation. So if you multiply some two permutations in the symmetric group that have many simple reflections in them, you have a choice as to how you factor into simple reflections, and it's not obvious that you get the same result no matter which choice you choose. Um, uh, so what I'm about to tell you is a is a is another definition of this de Maizer product that makes it tra totally transparent that this is well defined. So anyway, so this this uh, this gadget uh, has a, has appeared in algebraic geometry a couple times before, especially in Schubert calculus. Uh, and it turns out that this is exactly the gadget that we need to study this these permutations associated to divisors. Uh, so the first tool that's needed is to make a little generalization. So here I'm talking about the symmetric group. Uh, so permutations of a finite set, set of n integers. And I want to make a generalization of this where I talk about permutations of the full set of integers. So this generalization is encapsulated in the following uh, theorem. So I want to consider permutations alpha of the full set of integers, not just a, a finite set. So these are the sorts of permutations that we're thinking about when we're associating them to divisors. And I do have to impose one finiteness condition, but it's a relatively weak finiteness condition that I call almost sign preserving. Uh, and so let me give you a definition of this condition. What this means is that there are less there are finitely many integers n such that n and alpha n have different signs. So another way to think about this, if you think about it in terms of the graph of the permutation, so if I draw the graph of the permutation like so, uh, to say that the permutation is almost sign preserving means that there are less than infinity points in the graph in the lower right quadrant and also less than infinity points in the graph in the upper left quadrant. So we need this, uh, need this finiteness condition. And uh, you'll notice, by the way, that this is certainly true of the permutations that we care about because 
those two quadrants are counting ranks of divisors on a, on a metric graph, so they're certainly finite. Um, and so these are the permutations that, that we can think about. But this is a quite a large group. I mean, this is a, an uncountable group. Uh, so, 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 so it's not a huge, huge restriction on the permutations that we care about. And I want to tell you how to define a de Maizer product on this much larger uh, group of permutations. Um, and so the theorem says that there's this associative product star. It's going to coincide with the old de Maizer product on the symmetric group. And it's defined by, uh, in, in a kind of a intriguing way, in my opinion, which is it's tropical matrix multiplication. Uh, the thing that I need to explain is what matrix I'm thinking about. And here's the definition I make. If I have the permutation alpha, I associate, it, associate to it a matrix that I'll call S alpha. Uh, and I'm putting matrix in quotes because this is not a finite matrix. This is actually an infinite matrix. It has rows indexed by Z and columns indexed by Z. Um, and the entries of this matrix are these counts that I mentioned defining the permutations associated to divisors. So entry IJ in this matrix tells you the number of integers greater than or equal to J such that alpha of n is less than i. So this is counting the number of points in one of these little quadrants uh, in, the, uh, in the graph of the permutation. So you can associate this big matrix to the permutation by making all these different counts. And now the way you can define the de Maizer product on permutations is by tropically multiplying these matrices. So what do I mean by tropically multiplying? Well, min, uh, the minimum, this is the tropical multiplication, excuse me, the tropical uh, sum. And the addition here, this is tropical multiplication. And so when you put these together, you can write down a tropical matrix multiplication. And if you, if you tropically multiply the matrices associated to two permutations, uh, the theorem says that you get a matrix associated to another permutation. Uh, and that permutation is what I'm calling alpha star beta. So what I like about this description of the, of the de Maizer product is that in this description, it's relatively easy to check that this is an associative operation and it's completely transparent that this doesn't depend on a choice of factorization. So this is a nice close form for it. Uh, the main defect of this definition and the reason this is a theorem instead of a definition is that it's not obvious, at least not obvious to me, that when you tropically multiply two matrices, you get another matrix that is actually associated to a permutation and isn't just some other crazy matrix. So that's what actually ha has to be proved uh, in this theorem. Um, OK, so this is verified in the preprint that, that, you'll, that is going to go up later today. And the good news is that when you restrict to the symmetric group, uh, and when I say restricted to the symmetric group, what I mean is you do the usual thing uh, with a symmetric group, which is that if you have the graph of a permutation on the set uh, one through n, uh, you extend it by the identity permutation to the rest of the integers. Okay. Um, so as long as you make that embedding, you embed the uh, symmetric group into the group of all integer permutations, this de Maizer product that I've written with tropical matrix multiplication, this is the same de Maizer product as uh, the one that I wrote down before in terms of the greedy description, adding as many inversions as possible. Okay, so this is a this is an associative operation in integer permutations, and and it's a it's a surprisingly useful operation in my opinion. You can I. I uh, the reason I wrote this preprint that's coming out today is that I kept bumping into this tropical matrix multiplication in a couple of different problems in tropical and algebraic geometry and, and could not find a reference to it in the literature, not at this level of generality anyway. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll, we'll in, in the near future, we'll be able to find a lot more uses for it in, in these sorts of problems. Uh, one general comment, by the way, is that, uh, okay, so I, I mentioned earlier that this formula, and uh, let me actually write this on the slide to, to codify it, that this formula can be thought of as tropical matrix multiplication. Um, one of the questions I've been getting from a lot of people about this preprint is whether I have an explanation for uh, whether there's some tropical geometry involved in this tropical matrix multiplication. And I 
imagine there probably is, but at the moment, it's just a coincidence as far as I know. So we're studying this problem in tropical geometry, namely permutations associated with divisors. We encounter this operation on permutations called the Demeser product, which happens to be, be defined by a tropical matrix multiplication. But I don't know if there's some underlying tropical geometry where this is the tropicalization of multiplication of some actual matrices in, in another setting. And I would love to see that clarified. I, I don't really have a good explanation for it for it yet. So for example, I don't know if there's some detropicalization of this Demeser product that, uh, that means something geometric in this problem. Uh, so for my purposes, this is just a nice associative operation permutations. And the reason it is so useful is that it tells you what to do when you glue graphs together. So here's the theorem uh, that relates the, this Demeser product to these permutations on twice marked graphs. Uh, this, this beginning of this theorem is that we're given two twice marked graphs. So I'll call these gamma one and gamma two, and they're glued at marked points. So I uh, glue together these two twice marked graphs, gamma one and gamma two, to form a bigger twice marked graph gamma. And maybe for emphasis, I should write that the marked points on gamma one are u and v, the marked points on gamma two are v and w, and I absorb the middle uh, marked point into, into this gluing, and my new marked points are u and w. So the leftmost marked point and the rightmost marked point. Uh, and uh, the theorem tells you how to write down the permutations associated to divisors on this vertex gluing. So for any divisor on this vertex gluing, the divisor on the glued graph, um, I can compute its permutation by first splitting it across the two graphs. So for example, maybe this divisor here, I'll call D1. This is the part of a divisor that sits on the left marked graph. And maybe this divisor, I'm writing on the right side in red, is D2. That's the divisor on the rightmost graph. And I'm considering a divisor of the form D equals D1 plus D2. If I split the divisor across the two pieces. And uh, you can probably guess from uh, the context of this talk what I'm going to write next. Uh, if I want the permutation associated to a divisor on the glued graph, what I do is I take the two permutations on the two graphs separately and take their Demeser product. So do this tropical matrix multiplication, or if you like, if these are finite permutations, do this greedy algorithm where you add the adjacent transpositions that make the length as long as possible. And that tells you the permutation on the, on the larger glued, glued gra graph. Uh, and I should say here, this is assuming that D1 and D2 are submodular. Okay. okay, so the Demeser product is exactly the combinatorial gadget that you need in order to glue twice marked graphs and induct on genus. And so now I can tell you how, the, uh, how I proved this theorem that I mentioned earlier, that the chain of loops is general in the stronger sense that number of inversions is at most G, is you just start with the following observation. If you have these two permutations, the first permutation has fewer than G1 inversions, where G1 is the genus of the graph on the left. And the second permutation has at most G2 inversions where G2 is the genus of the graph on the right. Then it follows that when you take the Demeser product, the number of inversions is sub additive. This is a consequence of this greedy characterization of the Demeser product. Uh, now you have at most G1 plus G2 inversions, which is of course the genus of the glued graph. Um, so uh, you can now use this to, uh, to prove the theorem on chains of loops by induction.
So theorem on the chain of loops follows by induction. Okay. Uh, is, it, is it is it important to uh, glue them uh, along a common vertex? So, so I mean, yeah, glue glue them at these one of the marked points, or not necessarily like the way you have done it in your theory. Yes. So so that does turn out to be very important, and the reason is that the that marked point is something that the permutation knows about. So the permutation tau one or tau of d one knows about twists at the marked point v. And similarly, the permutation of D2 knows about twists at the marked point V. Right. And when you yeah. glue them together, that means those permutations tell you the information you need to combine the ranks together on the, on the group. Right. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and maybe just a, a side comment here. Uh, the way that you prove this theorem essentially boils down to showing a certain tropical matrix multiplication formula for these for all of these ranks taken together. And the key is that tropical matrix multiplication is built out of a whole bunch of tropical dot products. Uh, and you can prove a lemma that says that if, you're, if you want to compute a rank of a divisor on a glued graph, you can compute it using a tropical dot product of a bunch of ranks on the left and a bunch of ranks on the right. So that's what makes this, uh, this theorem possible. Okay, uh, so I have just a, a few minutes left, and uh, in these few minutes, I want to say something about the, at the very top, I mentioned there were two versions of this story. There was the brill norther theorem, the classical one, about a general curve of genus G and H0 times H1, and then there's this new version, this Philip Hurwitz brill norther theorem that's about a general cover and tells you about uh, this certain X1. And so far in the combinatorial story, all I've been telling you about is the classical version, the H0 times H1. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to summarize what happens in the, uh, the, in the Hurwitz case. And the idea is that it turns out that, base, that part of the benefit of this whole framework of attaching permutations to divisors and thinking about the major products of permutations is that it actually very neatly can do the Hurwitz brill norther story as well. So I haven't told that story just for simplicity yet, simplicity yet, but I can do it in this one slide and just tell you a few modifications that I need to make to get the Hurwitz brill norther version instead. And here's how it works. So in, for Hurwitz brill norther generality, we consider now a, what you could call a K-gonal chain. So this, so for example, I consider a chain of loops where on each loop in the chain, I have uh, V and W on a genus one graph, such that this uh, difference of the two marked points, U minus V is K torsion, K torsion in the Jacobian. So this is an example of a K gonal chain, and this is the right graph to consider if you want to think about the specialization of a K fold cover uh, of a, um, so a, an algebraic curve with a, with a degree k, k rational function. Um, if you consider this chain instead, I can do a similar analysis, but I just need to make a couple of replacements. The first observation is that the permutations you get, if you have a k, if the two marked points differ by torsion, you have a certain periodicity in the permutations you get. And they're called, they're what's called extended k affine permutations. So if you add k to an input, you always add k to the output. This is, an, this is a pretty quick consequence of the definition of these permutations. What that means is if you have an inversion of the permutation and you add K to both the inputs, you get another inversion. <clears throat> so in other words, once you have one inversion, you have infinitely many inversions. So if you think about K affine permutations, counting inversions isn't the right thing to do, but you can define this new number instead that I'll call inv K. And you can think about this as just the number of inversions where M is between zero and K. Alternatively, you can think about this as uh, congruence classes of inversions. And now I can tell the exact same story that I just did in the previous slides. And just instead of counting inversions, count inversions modulo K. 
And it turns out that if you follow the specialization procedure and analyze how do you understand this X quantity I told you about in terms of ranks of divisors on the metric graph, uh, you can actually bound that by this number, this number of inversions modulo K. And then you can do the exact same inductive machine to say, in, so if you have a K-gonal chain, instead of saying the number of inversions is at most G, I can say that the number of inversions modulo K of any divisor is at most G. Uh, and this is, some, is something you can now use to prove hervitz brillner generality. So this is part of why I like this framework about thinking about these permutations and these, uh, this Demaser product is that it very, very neatly folds together these two stories that, have, that until now have been studied in, in slightly different ways. Uh, so both the brillner theorem and the hervitz brillner theorem you can think of as being about the same thing, which is bounding the complexity of a permutation. The only difference is, are you counting, literally counting inversions or are you counting inversions modulo K? And you use the same machine. We use the Demeser product to study, uh, to study both problems. So uh, why I really like this whole setup is that uh, I, I'm hoping that this, this basic tool, this tool of using these permutations and using the Demeser product is going to make it easier to break down uh, tropical geometry, geometry problems about metric graphs to smaller components. So breaking problems about the chain of loops down to an individual loop uh, and, uh, and to do some inductive arguments uh, that way. So I, I'm, I think that there's a lot more combinatorics hiding in this whole setup that I'm hoping will be uh, unearthed over time. But for now, this is just a little, uh, a little preview of it, of uh, the sorts of things you can do with it. So I, I should finish uh, now. And uh, again, thanks very much for the uh, invitation. I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan, for the very interesting talk. Uh, sorry, Nathan, it's a really interesting talk. Questions, comments? Questions? Yes, Prana. Yeah, I can use this. So uh, there's a notion of uh, Demazur products for other for coxeter groups in general, right? So, yes, that's a very uh, big question. Is it, is it meaningful to ask whether that will have some role to play in, uh, in your setting in tropical geometry? Yeah, so uh, I don't know for sure. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I guess one thing I can say is that there is one other coxeter group that's definitely involved, which is the affine symmetric group. Um, so uh, and indeed, the, U, the de Maser product on the affine symmetric group cohen is also given by this tropical matrix multiplication formula. <clears throat> so this de Maser product on almost sign preserving permutations essentially mutually combines the de Maser products on, on those two Coxeter groups. So that one definitely is involved and, and that's the right Coxeter group to think about in Hervis Brunner, the theory. <clears throat> As to whether de Maser products and other Coxeter groups have some implications, uh, I don't know. I think it would be, I don't know of any examples yet. I don't really have a candidate for the next one to think about, but I could certainly imagine that there is maybe a different class of curves. So rather than thinking about general curves or kagonal curves, maybe there's a curve with some other extra structure that naturally lends itself to studying via, by some, via some other Coxeter group. Uh, but I don't have a, an idea for what that should be yet. I will also say the other obstacle is that in this setup, I'm really depending on this um, uh, this tropical matrix multiplication definition of the Demeser product, um, which is based on constructing these matrices out of out of permutations, and this is very much specific to permutations per se, whether affine permutations or or ordinary permutations. So I don't know what the analog of this would be for for other Coxeter groups, but it would not surprise me if there's something. Thank you. Any other questions? So I had a couple of questions. So uh, uh, firstly, um, uh, does it make sense to um, uh, 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 talk of uh, uh, Riemann rock theory, for instance, um, in this uh, two point setting? So uh, uh, is there a, some kind of a refinement maybe of, of the, the, the original Riemann rock theorem on, on graphs, metric or otherwise? 
<clears throat> in this two pointed setting so would you would you suggest reformulating for instance uh, the riemann roch theorem in terms of these permutations for two uh, yeah in the case of two in a sense yeah so so the riemann roch theorem is definitely uh used throughout this story i guess i would say that it's not so much that you need a refined riemann roch theorem because huh. you can use the usual riemann roch theorem you you basically use it simultaneously for all the twists but i can tell you an interesting right. uh, uh, an interesting formula about this which basically says the following so if i define um uh, the following quantity, let's say that S alpha of AB are these numbers I've written a couple times, the number of integers L greater than or equal to B, such that alpha of A is less than A. Uh, riemann roch theorem has the following kind of neat uh, consequence. So riemann roch uh, basically corresponds to the following equation. There's a duality between this function associated to alpha and this function associated to alpha's inverse. So, and it's written as follows, that the difference between S alpha of AB and S alpha inverse of BA, I have to switch the A and the B for, for some technical reasons. Um, this is going to be equal to a certain number that I'll call chi alpha. This is just an integer that I'm calling the shift of alpha wow. plus A minus B. Um, and so, for example, the shift of alpha in, um, uh, in the case that we're thinking about is determined by the degree of the divisor. Oh. Um, so this is a, this provides a certain uh, duality that, that is used throughout, um, uh, throughout this picture here. Um, yeah, and the idea is, but the reason that this isn't adding something new per se is that if I define uh, uh, D prime to be this twisted version of the divisor, this quantity I've written on the left is simply rank of D prime minus rank of k minus d prime. And so, so it's the usual riemann roch theorem. But it's absolutely involved basically throughout the whole uh, analysis. And, and how, how are these permutations um, uh, uh, tau d and tau k minus d related to each other? Is there a simple relationship between those? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So the relation is the following. Uh, tau k minus d is almost equal to the inverse of tau d. Um, but I just need to, um, there's a small modification and I just need, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I forget exactly the formula off the top of my head, but I believe it's something like the following. Uh, I conjugate it by iota where iota of N is equal to, um, N plus one. So I, I may have the sign wrong here. I maybe need to conjugate on the other side. So it's something like this. So, so up to some conjugation, uh, the Sarah dual divisor corresponds to the inverse permutation. Yes. Very interesting, huh? And 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 this uh, sort of the, the choice of the two points that again uh, probably uh, seems to come from um, this, this chain of loops, right? The chain of loops that you you sort of had that in mind that uh, mm -hmm. you you sort of wanted to do these inductive arguments and these chains of loops have uh, each each loop has sort of two marked points um, uh, based on where it is connected to to the rest of the chain of loops. So so uh, but you could uh, uh, have you thought about generally fix. Uh, k marked points and 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 then try to develop uh, something like this. So you look at rank of of d plus um, yeah m one times um, the uh, yeah v one and so on m two times yeah v1. absolutely um, yeah absolutely. So I, I it's I have thought about it. I don't have great insight into it yet, um, and I can tell you some of the things that get trickier. So huh. the first difficulty is that. The nice thing about two marked points is that there's this nice combinatorial object that you can use to encode all those ranks, which is the, a permutation. And I'm not yeah. sure what the right combinatorial object is for three or more marked points. Um, it would, but I suspect that I suspect there's something. I just don't know exactly what it is. Um, okay. That's the first obstacle. The the other thing that makes me nervous about that case yes. is that um, tropical curves. Are, are sort of don't know about characteristic of fields. So you can specialize a characteristic P curve or a characteristic zero curve for the same metric graph. Wow. And 
the story of Brill Northern theory for three or more marked points is much more complicated and characteristic P. So the okay. usual version of the marked point Brill Northern theorem for three or more marked points is just false and characteristic P for reasons having okay. to do with um, wild ramification. Oh. So that makes me nervous about the marked point version of three, or the tropical version of three or more marked points. I don't know if that's a fatal uh, issue. I think maybe if you just set things up carefully, uh, there's still something that can be said, but um, but it's one reason to suspect the story could be more complicated. Yes, but yes, I, do, yes. I, I do really hope something is true there because um, for example, here's, here's one sort of uh, dream that, uh, that I have about this that I'm, that, um, uh, that I would love to see kind of realized in some sense is if you have a more general graph that is not necessarily a chain of loops, for example, and yeah, you want to use yeah. similar techniques to understand it, one way you could try to do it is by choosing a spanning tree. So maybe I could do something like, you know, here's a, um, you know, I, I split this up into a, a spanning tree. And then what I do to the spanning tree is I kind of glue you know, glued paired, paired vertices to each other one at a time. And I would love to have some result that says something like, if you understand, you know, the analog of this transmission permutation for this tree with all of these marked points and then glue the points pair by pair to eventually construct the situation on the general graph. And the reason that this is interesting is so the chain of loops, for example, this is exactly what you're doing without really realizing it when you chain these loops together, because what you can think about is, um, basically a chain of loops that's been disconnected that you sort of clipped each, each loop and then you join those, those points together one at a time to, to go from a tree to a chain of loops. Um, so uh, it just so happens that when you're, when you're in the chain of loops case, because you're joining two vertices that were linearly equivalent on the previous graph, it's much easier to, to make this inductive argument. But what I would love to see is something where if you start with a tree and a bunch of points you're planning to glue together, some sort of combinatorial procedure you can use to kind of glue those two at a time and, oh. and eventually learn about the, the, the ranks of the divisors on the tree. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I've thought about it for this reason, but I, like I said, I don't have any insight yet. It's really just a kind of um, hope at okay, this point. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. And um, um I, yeah, maybe we should uh, see if the online audience have any questions. Online audience has any questions? Online audience, any questions? Yeah, you can you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask the questions directly. Okay, nothing, not, not seemingly no questions as of now. Okay, so um, one final question. So uh, this, uh, so uh, you have these papers where you also considered um, special, um, uh, not general, but special uh, chains of loops, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, where you um, you you studied these uh, WRDs um, and and you sort of wrote, you have this formula expressing them as a union of tori and so on. Mm -hmm. So so uh, so that also. Uh, you 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 foresee sort of being reworked in this two pointed setting. So you have uh, so what would WRD be in this two pointed case? Yeah. So the uh, the there's a nice dictionary uh, as follows. Uh, for if I fix a permutation tau, I could define a locus. Maybe I'll call it W tau to be the um, the locus where of, of divisor classes D such that the, the permutation associated to divisor is at least right. tau. And at least wow. here I'm referring to the Bruhat order, which mm -hmm. I won't define right now, but it's, um, if, if it, it basically just means that um, the ranks imposed by tau d are at least as large as the ranks imposed by tau. And if you consider one particular permutation, namely this one, if I consider a permutation that has R plus one points in the lower right quadrant uh -huh. and G minus D plus R points in the upper left quadrant and is increasing uh -huh. other than that, you can actually write down an equality that the locus of divisors with that transmission permutation is equal on the nose to WRD. Um, so there's some things to be proved here, but uh, 
but this is how it works out. So, so for basically, I need to prove that the only condition you actually impose with gamma is the condition on the rank of the divisor itself. Uh, so WRD, you can understand, is the locus of permutations with a given uh, partition. And there is, there is one of these decompositions into tori uh, much, in much the same way as this, as this earlier paper that you're referring to. So on the chain of loops, for example, you, have a, you can write down a formula of the following form that W gamma is going to be a union indexed by a bunch of permutations, tau one through tau G, whose demais or product is equal to gamma. And you have a union of W tau one, W okay. tau two up to W tau G. Oh, so, so this is the analog of that union of tori. Um, okay, that's and, nice. uh, it, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's the same decomposition. What I like about this one is that you can really localize to all the cycles individually rather than thinking about this kind of growing the partition one step at a time. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's very, very interesting. Yeah. Any, any, any other questions? The offline audience? Online audience? All right. Yeah, th th let's thank uh, Nathan again for the wonderful talk. Very interesting talk. Yeah, thank you so much, Nathan. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure.